morning, everybody. This is Perry, uh, Perry Smith from the Avalon Institute, uh, joined by uh, Avalon partner Cameron Gott. Uh, this is a brief video, brief I say about a little bit over 30 minute video, um, breaking down uh, cognitive preferences. As you know, we have, uh, this is the, uh, uh, an addition to the Wired to Lead podcast where we interview uh, leaders and athletes and a whole array of uh, folks on how their cognitive preferences serve them and also sometimes where they can be a blind spot. So what we'll do today is we'll break down um, each specific um, uh, preference. Um, the, first will, the first three will be uh, uh, associative, uh, sequential, uh, and then dual processing, not specifically in that order. And then we'll talk about the I mortal domains, which are mover, observer, reader, talker, and listener. Now, let's a little bit of the background on this, that what the CPP does, and this is available on the Avalon uh, Leadership uh, website, avalonleadership.com, is it identifies the hardwired traits in your brain. In other words, what kind of cognitive activities your brain does efficiently versus the activities your brain does a little bit more inefficiently, although perhaps well. So what we're gonna also try and do here is, is throw in some practical advice when we, we show you how these uh, preferences uh, may work for you um, and, and maybe even get to the, the what for or the so what portion of this. So I'm gonna turn it over to Cam here real quick. We are going to go through these slides and give you this overview. And again, as we say, this is the cognitive peak profile, maximizing your cognitive preferences. It's like having a secret weapon. Cam, jump in. Hope things are going well today. You got it. Yeah, and I like that the bottom piece there is that understanding and maximizing your cognitive preferences is, is truly like having a secret weapon. And I think Agreed. that it's a secret weapon that often people overlook. So let's move to the next slide there, Perry. So um, we all have preferences. We, uh, we uh, demonstrate our preferences all the time, right? Of, of uh, what clothes we're gonna wear, uh, who we hang out with, uh, where we go on vacation. And uh, our brain makes preferences, has preferences too. But uh, often we're not necessarily paying attention to it. It's in the background of, uh, what kind of information is salient, uh, what matters, and also what doesn't matter. So uh, this is what the CPP is based on, is looking at these preferences that are innate uh, to us. Go ahead, next slide there. Perry. Sure. So these questions that are on the slide here, these are natural questions that we ask, and uh, we often don't think that they're actually uh, brain questions. Um, why can't I sit still? Why do I find it impossible to, to, to remember what I read? Um, why do some people never stop talking? Right? So they can be uh, questions that are born out of annoyance, if you will. And it's like, why is it that I can't do this? Or why is it that I do that? Why is it they do this? Uh, why is she doing that? And actually, the brain is at work here. Uh, exerting its preferences. Um, the brain has something called homeostasis where it, it, it uh, likes to kind of stay the course. It's like a, a large ocean going vessel that uh, is not gonna respond to change. And imagine if we were changing all the time, uh, we would never be progressing as a human species, right? So, That's true. yeah. So uh, we're gonna dig into some of these brain profile questions and the CPP is a wonderful tool to do that. Hey, Next slide. Yeah, well, actually, one thing I do want to jump in about it, and just so everybody is clear on this, is that this is not a psychological evaluation. This this shows uh, again. Think of it. Think of it. That your brain networks, and and think of them as being kind of like a muscle. You know, sometimes it takes a little bit to get a muscle warmed up and active, um, and then it can be very efficient. Other times, it could activate immediately. Um, so this is what we're talking about here, because someone once said. Um, the difference uh, with the CPP versus the Myers-Briggs is the Myers-Briggs may tell you how you feel and give you some general categories. Uh, this is a lot more specific. And what we love about it is that it's also can become intentional very fast once you get, uh, gain an awareness of your preferences. So uh, the cognitive peak profile is really broken into uh, two areas of focus. There's the three cognitive processing modes, and then there are the five domains of information 
um, information intake and outtake activation. We call that the I mortal. So the five domains are mover, observer, reader, talker, and listener. The three cognitive processing modes are sequential, associative, and dual. Um, let's go ahead and we'll just move right into the three uh, processors. So um, before we get into sequentials, I just want to give a little background information here. Is that actually, uh, Perry, can you go back to the last slide? I'm sorry. Let's see if I can figure out a way to do that. No, that's okay. Oh, okay. What so, do you want to reference on that? Yeah, you may want to reference back. Um, I just want to give some oversight to these three ways that we process information. And so recent uh, neuroscientific studies are showing that uh, we have two processors. We have a sequential processor and we have an associative processor. And that um, two books that are very important to our work are uh, Daniel Kahneman's Think Fast, Thinking Fast and Slow. And also uh, Coslin's book, uh, Top Brain, Bottom Brain. And those are two references here if you want to go and, and look this up. Um, and so we see that uh, in the work that we do that, that uh, everyone will uh, have a preference, whether it's sequential, associative, or what we call balanced access or dual processor. Um, the sequential on this slide is that uh, these are the next steppers. They tend to be um, the majority of those sampled in some of the foundational studies done by Open Book Learning, uh, a gentleman named Frank Sopper. And um, our sequential that we've uh, talked to on the Wired to Lead podcast is Chris Lum. He was our Wired to Lead podcast number one. So uh, Chris is really... Um, how he processes information actually influences the type of questions he will ask. Uh, and some of these questions would be based on um, what authority, what evidence, uh, what is the process, rules, categories. They tend to be deadline, um, focused on deadlines and, and making things happen. And the indicators are typically structured, uh, linear, and uh, in, in, in our words here, lockstep. Perry, you want to add anything to this? Yeah, I mean, just, well, uh, Chris is a teammate and a, a very, very accomplished teammate of ours. He's a former, uh, um, uh, was up for the Walter Payton Award um, uh, in, in uh, FCS uh, subdivision football, played at Lehigh University, broke all sorts of records, uh, threw for thousands of yards, uh, was, a, was a very, very effective leader. Um, what's interesting about uh, talking with Chris about after he took the CPP is it just just to understand where he was coming from he the epiphany that went you know came to him was that he needed to ask instead of the how how are we going to get there what are the next steps he needed to act, uh, start asking and helping teammates with the why because for him the how was just it was it was just that was the next step and you know that was broken down from the workouts they were doing to the time it took to do the workouts but he needed to inspire people a bit more to get them to understand, okay, here's the, here's the, the idea, um, the passion, if you will, um, because he was more focused on those next steps to, to get from point A to point Z, and, uh, and that worked very well for him. But once he started to, to understand this a little bit more, um, you know, and, and especially, of course, after he graduated from Lehigh, uh, plugging that into, into leadership structures in his life now. Right, we talked about, um what I appreciated in the conversation was his, uh, the precision in his, in his language. Mm -hmm. I think that this is one of the things that the CPP can do is language really provides insight into how we process and how we build knowledge. So with the CPP, we are, we utilize that with some coaching skills of really listening to the client's language and reflecting that back to them. He, um, he also, we talked about uh, this concept of creative process, right? That, that he yep. was uh, really took that to the next level. And um, as you said, he's well aware of the blind spot of what is often um, around the why uh, context. And um, for him, it was uh, you know, paying attention to relationships 
and that they matter, right? It's not just about right. getting things done, but um, taking a moment to pause and check in with people in order to build that team. That's right. So, let's do the sure. next slide. Sure. So the other processor that's at work, and then everyone has access to both of these. There's the sequential. That's a good point. Yes, yes, I'm sorry to cut you off, but that is a very, very good point. Let, let, and let me jump in on that real quick. So tracking back to Chris, Chris may be a sequential preferent processor. That does not mean he doesn't have access to the associative uh, 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 portion of his brain as well. That network is very strong, very robust. It just activates slightly uh, at, at a different rate, um, that fast thinking, than, than, the, um, than, than the sequential thinking. So go ahead, Cam. Sorry to cut you off. That's okay. So, and as we said, the, um, you know, back to Kahneman's thinking fast uh, and slow, the, the, the sequential is really connected with the, 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 the slower processor. It's relative. Um, it, there's no preference here that you should have one or the other. It's just good information to have and recognize where you are on the, on the spectrum uh, or on the scale. Yep. And so um, the associatives or dot connectors, they are more preferent to uh, the associative processor, which is uh, the fast processor or the faster um, system one processor in, in Kahneman's work. And, um, and in Coslin's book, it's more of the bottom brain um, versus the top brain. The top brain is associated with more of the sequential and the bottom brain is associated more with the associative processor. So um, where 60 or so percent were sampled in the, in the sequential, about 35%, uh, 36% are sampled in these studies of associatives. Um, That's right. And uh, I'm a high associative. Uh, we're, we're wired for context. And, uh, and so we lead with those questions. Um, and so it's more about the why um, and wanting a compelling why. So um, some of the people that I work with tend to be visionaries. They're very much in touch with uh, the why. So we spoke with Pete York. Um, he's going to be coming up in one of our Wired to Lead podcasts. So he's a visionary around um, uh, uh, evaluation and, um, and uh, big data, using data analytics to um, help with around social sciences and evaluation. He is very much in touch with his why. Um, the same thing with uh, Kiko Matthews, who is one of our Wired to Lead uh, uh, guests. She's a number, uh, number two, I believe. And again, she has a compelling why of why she's uh, rowing across the Atlantic. And, right. and that's a big expanse and she she did a great job on on that podcast kind of filling in those gaps and and um in understanding how that vision evolved kim because uh, i we look at associatives and we say how, how flexible they can be in their thinking and how they can work in gray areas um a lot of the folks that we work with down at uh, jsou which is um, a joint special operations university in tampa uh, florida they, they, they showed up uh, very much in the high associative realm. Um, well, we, a little bit of a difference uh, when we get into what we talk about later about immortal domains. But they, they talk about how, um, you know, a, 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 one of the sayings in special forces is uh, no plan survives first contact. Well, if you put that in front of a, a sequential thinker, a sequential preference thinker, they're saying, no, 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 I'm going to create a plan that will survive first contact. But they're very, very um, adaptable. Uh, flexible, and as I said, are, are, are good at working boundaries. And, and as long as the core of the mission uh, is, is uh, set or it, it, um, it has weight that they can say, you know, what, what are we here to defend or what, are we, what is the objective, then they can be very flexible in getting to, you know, to the hows of that. Right. So uh, having that structure in place or that framework um, is really key for associatives. Yes. Uh, to have that compelling why. Um, and, uh, you know, Kiko spoke of, uh, again, her language was really interesting around this, this associative processor, is that um, you notice is her plan for paddling or rowing was to um, be open to modification, 
try different things. And uh, she had, you know, plenty of days to try a different way to whether, you know, her, her uh, pattern of sleep, rest and rowing. Um, and she was very much open to that. She also talked about this term economics, right? right. This real ownership <laughs> of, she didn't try to learn the sequential, uh, you know, QuickBooks method around economics, right? The, the, the linear lockstep but to be open to um, her own interpretation, pay attention to that. I think that where, where associatives can get, um, be challenged is around um, decision-making. Um, maybe not necessarily committing going forward to a completion point. Or prioritizing, it, right? Right, prioritizing. Say, how can, can I be, wait this out? Right, What's um, the way that with that dot connector, with the high associative, a lot of stuff is coming at them all the time, especially, and we're going to get into the eye mortal, but if they're, a, if they're a highest observer coupled with that high associative, uh, they can be kind of um, inundated with information and it's pulling out that salient information and, and making use and staying the course long enough to get that completion. Well, the other thing so that can be, the other thing is around um, you know, staying organized. Um, oh, that, correct just managing daily tasks and the paperwork and the email trails that go with that. Uh, a lot of systems that are out there are really sequential in nature. So finding a system that works for you can be really beneficial. That's correct. Let's move forward here. The next, the next category uh, is dual processors or maximizers. This is a real, well, I'm going to qualify this real quick, Cam. We will not get through this here. So we will have a supplemental um, on, on especially for dual processors as well, because it is very complex. But let's let's jump in a little bit on the um, on the language around dual processors. Right. So and again, um, you can always refer back to this page. We're not going to cover everything here, um, but dual processors it, it, it enjoy a, a balanced access to both the sequential and the associative, uh, not at the same time they will uh, rapidly shift back and forth between the two. Uh, my, in my understanding or, or appreciation of dual processors, those who are aware of which processor they are in in that moment can be very beneficial. Um, when one is not aware, it can, um, it, it can be challenging at times to just uh, uh, feel a sense of dissonance or wh why is it that I'm always, uh, you know, wanting to challenge what that guy's saying, right? And it might be that you're holding the opposite, right? Where if you're in a, as Aaron um, Mattias, uh, who is a uh, Wired to Lead number three podcast, she's a dual processor and she would, with her swimmers, who are, many were high associative, she felt that she was often going to the sequential side to try to anchor them. And That's it right. can be, and it can be exhausting. Um, dual processors are, are a much smaller sample. Uh, a lot of leaders uh, in, in these uh, connecting positions. You know, if you imagine a CEO who, um, a good CEO is able to speak with uh, people over in IT or uh, the accountants, the bean counters, um, and then also speak with the creative folks over in marketing, right? To be able to have that language, they are able to move back and forth between uh, the associative and the, and the sequential. Perry, you want to add something here as, as a dual processor? Dual processor. Well, <laughs> love to hear your perspective on this. Well, it's, it, is, it is the notion at times it can be of, of like having two minds and, and awareness for dual processors is so uh, important. Um, that, you know, we can name a number that we, that we believe of, of, that people may have heard of, of course, that, you know, that we believe are dual processors because we've studied this from a lay perspective, but I would say um, Abraham Lincoln, um, being able to hold these opposites, um, understanding that, that there is a central or core idea to be able to synthesize the, the how and the why and make it an even more powerful message. Um, there, there are other folks in leadership. I mean, Cam, I, I would throw out just conversationally speaking, I think that uh, uh, President Obama was a dual processor. Um, a lot of a lot of bouncing back and forth again between process and then um, the associative uh, side, which is the, the why to come up, uh, you know, with, with a, a different answer for something. Uh, sometimes it serves us well. Other times it can be confusing to people. The one one thing 
anyone listening to this who, who may get an inkling if they haven't taken the survey that they may be a dual processor is it's like having two conversations going on in your head at times. Um, they can be very robust conversations. Um, but if you take something away from this knowledge of being a dual processor, what I would say to you is take time uh, to and allow time to happen to, to make decisions. Sometimes your best decision will be made the next morning. So, so a lot of dual processors, their language, you can pick it out. They say, well, that depends. Uh, they're not waffling, they're, but they really, really are going through a, uh, a, a different process. It's, a, it's like you know, two streams. Um, you know, you kind of have the, if anybody's ever been whitewater rafting, you know, sometimes you have the center and the channel, and that's, that's very, very nice, but you may want to curve off to the side to go, uh, go hit that, you know, hit that uh, class three rapids or class four rapids. So, so it's, it's a bit like that, um, but it is fascinating. And, and we have, you know, more information up. Um, you mentioned Erin Matthews and Erin is a dual processor. And so um, her, her uh, you know, position on, on the Wired to Lead podcast is there. And you can definitely check her out there. So. Right. This is, um, so in the, this introduction or primer, we want to have this as a reference, but the best thing to do is go and, and listen to some of these um, interviews. Yeah, the because, stories. Yeah. yeah, the stories that are associated with it, you can start to hear the, these preferences come out. And really, again, um, this is why we chose to have uh, these three as our, as our lead offs, right? To show these different processors um, at work. Let's go ahead and move on to the um, iMortals. So um, we talked about how the processors are based in some of this research around uh, how our brains are, have these two processors at work. Um, the iMortal is based on um, going back around uh, Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences work. Um, and so uh, Frank Sopper, who, who uh, developed the, uh, the, the cognitive peak profile at Open Book Learning, um, developed these, these, looked at these uh, five areas of mover, observer, reader, talker, and listener. If you look at that, um, you know, people are probably familiar with other learning style uh, type inventories. Um, it's like high verbal or auditory, kinesthetic. And so there's some uh, connection here. These are really um, how, I, how I like, what I liken it to is the, the ease in which you activate in these areas. And so uh, I am a high talker. And so it's easy for me. Um, to uh, really um, build meaning and uh, make sense of the world through language, through talking. Uh, I'm a coach, I'm also a trainer. Um, and I, I, I coach, um, I, I train coaches and I mentor coaches. And so uh, I'm teaching a lot, I'm speaking a lot. And as I'm speaking, that I'm doing some verbal processing there and it's yeah, very thinking out loud, right? Yeah. And it's thinking out loud in a sense yeah. and I'm making more meaning uh, as I speak. Um, the same thing with a, a listener. I'm a high listener. And so I've learned over the years to develop my listening skills. That's what uh, coaching is really pretty much all about is listening and asking um, uh, relevant and powerful questions. And so recognizing this has been very helpful to me so I can really lean on that asset. Right. I am uh, more of a selective reader and I've always been kind of curious. I was diagnosed with a mild reading disorder uh, back in seventh grade. You know, that was it. Mild reading disorder. So that was the tag, the label, right? That was the tag <laughs> and label. And I, there, were, there wasn't much I could go on that, Perry. You right. know, it was like, uh, okay, it's mild. So it's not dyslexia. Uh, but, uh, you know, so you did, just need to really try harder was, I think, the message. Right. So um, it just, what that means with a selective reader or low reader is that it takes more energy to activate uh, the synapses in that area of the brain of how we um, process text um, and decoding uh, language. You know, the, and so this is writing uh, and, and reading. 
Um, let's go ahead and jump in. We'll get to observer and mover as we sure. go through here. And, and, so, and let me let me qualify. So, so I want anyone listening. This is a snapshot. Um, there's a lot more depth here. We are just going over this um, uh, more as a as a survey or overview. Um, there are specific cog hacks uh, that we talk about and um, that we've developed at Avalon. So, so there are workarounds or cog hacks. We'll hit on a few of them now. Uh, but again, this is an overview, and we'll be providing more information at at, um, at later date. So, I move or go ahead. Yep. Yeah. So, so in the word I was looking for, which I appreciate, is prompted by the slides neurostimulus. <laughs> yeah. So, neurostimulus. Uh, is received from engaging gross and fine motor systems. So even you know, a high mover or an active mover, uh, just by moving their, their, the muscles around their jaw and talking can really uh, create some neurostimulus here. Um, the, of course, the higher your mover score is, the more movement you need to, to help activate your thinking. So how this works is if someone is a high mover, and I think that Chris, Kiko, and Aaron were all high movers. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, is that they tend to uh, create focus, um, engage better when they are moving. Um, a selective mover will often be more sedentary and be okay with sitting. They don't need to be moving to really uh, access this area of the brain. So just to, we'll move into the next category, just to give people a visual or something to think about. If you, uh, you, you might consider um, a couple of people who represent, uh, because I believe they are anyway, as, as a bit more low movers, you might, um, like Clint Eastwood uh, might be one. Um, if, if anybody has uh, any, any seen the Clint Eastwood movies, is, you know, he's the strong silent type. He doesn't move around a lot on the screen. Uh, when he does, it's very purposeful. Um, or, you know, the difference between Clint Eastwood and Jim Carrey. So Jim Carrey just takes over the screen and grinds <laughs> yeah. it up into different pieces because he's all over the map. And right. look at his characterizations. Well, he's obviously uh, an active mover. Um, I also find that movers, uh, act, more active movers, like to see movement. Um, they, they often like to see um, things moving ahead. Um, right. They tend to be more engaged. You know, so again, the the three individuals that we spoke of, they're all high movers. They'd like to see, again, they're engaged. You notice that Kiko is engaged in a lot of different things. She just engages differently, um, right? Sort of building up to this process of, and the logistics that it takes to get this boat loaded, moved over to the Canary Islands, right? Um, that's kind of movement and flow in a different way. I was learning so through experience. They have to, they're experiencing, they're, 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 it's almost like that seeing and tasting, but for them, they're, they're experiencing and touching it. And uh, in, in doing that, they're taking it deeper into memory. Absolutely. But, I, it, it, but again, the subtle distinction here is that I it also noticed that high movers like to see movement in the sense of yes. projects. Um, and, and, you know, again, they, um, in a sense, uh, they're impatient with circling around um, a discussion. You know, it's like, let's make a decision and let's move jump on. In. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to observer. Yeah. So this is really around uh, neurostimulus from uh, meaningful visual information, right? So, and really the system allows us to recognize two types, essential and symbolic. So uh, essential, you've, it's, it's what we see, what we actually see. And then, um, and, and, and a high observer will notice things in the room or notice things around that other folks will not, they will pick up. Um, so Sherlock Holmes is uh, a good example. And I was just watching the movie, um, the recent Sherlock Holmes movies with uh, Robert Downey Jr. And they actually have these uh, very rapid cuts of him walking into a room and noticing uh, details in the room. Right. The other thing is that they also um, symbolic visual information that uh, that that things have meaning more than just uh, what it is, but it has some representation, a metaphorical um, representation. So, and Perry, you're a high observer. I am not. I'm a lower observer. So. 
would you like to add some around what it is to have the experience of, of being a higher active observer? Uh, here's here's an example that I've used. I've talked with people about this before. I mean, everybody, everyone, majority of people out there know what Starbucks is, and maybe they've gone to Starbucks, and they can even kind of visualize what the logo looks like. Um, they say, you, yes, people say, okay, it's green. Yeah, um, I think there's a woman on it. Right. So the <laughs> the difference between what I tend to do, and uh, if I'm looking at a logo, is I will try and deconstruct the story perhaps behind that logo. So when I look at the Starbucks logo, I look at the green, I look at the ship. I I immediately relate that back to, um, you know, the foundations of what that, that image may have meant, you know, the goddess of the sea, the hair, the two tails of the mermaid, um, the star, um, (laughs) the association to Moby Dick and Starbuck, uh, who was the, the first mate of, you know, Captain Ahab, and so on and on and on and on. <laughs> See, can, is, now the, the people, are, you know, the people that make want to make more meaning out of the Starbucks logo. Now they might be high observers. What do you think? Well, they might be, but you know, the, the other ones who who uh, who really don't care about that just would really rather prefer to come in and just get coffee. Could right. I, yeah. Could I have a me. pike, place? Could I have a blonde? I mean, you know, am, am I am I really going to have the the pumpkin spice latte, uh, that type of thing. So, <laughs> so that's a little bit of the difference there. Wow. And, and, and it might, and, and again, it might also be when I see something like I, I think about my favorite, uh, you know, favorite artist. Um, I look at a Van Gogh, and and I'm see, I can stare at a Van Gogh all day. Now, the, we talk about blind spots here, Cam, and one of the, uh, the blind spots of this is that things can be distracting. Um, you know, people who are uh, you know, maybe a little bit lower on the observer uh, side. Um, they don't. They don't tend to get distracted by these things. They they prefer plain speak. They pre- you know, prefer plain imagery. Um, and and there's they don't they're not won't see that again. There's no preferred state though. I want to be clear about that. Right. Um, I, mean, I recall. Uh, I recall Frank Sopper tell, t- telling a story here about uh, that a high observer will you know uh, intuit their way across a dark room. Uh, but they might, you know, they just miss the light. They could just turn on the light and, and uh, not turn on the light. So that's right. Yeah. Let's well, there's a lot next. more, a lot more on these, about these discussions. And, and again, let's refer back to, to either, um, you know, the, our, our diversions on SoundCloud or these interactions on the podcast on YouTube. Um, I think in the interest of time for our listeners, so we're not boring, let's move on to, if we can, to reader. Right. So again, the um, neurostimulus, and, and so neur- neurostimulus is again, this, these areas of the brain that are activated uh, through each of these five areas. So for a high reader, it's around uh, decoding text. Um, and so, uh, boy, I, I, my daughter uh, made it to the, uh, the school final spelling bee. Wow, congrats. And yeah. Um, so she, she or she was hanging out with uh, mm. older kids and she is a reader. And I know she's a high reader. And, um, and so she, the, we, when we were practicing, uh, I was in, just amazed at how her recall and her ability to spell words, right? So this sort of, we, we can sort of look at it as this uh, natural uh, ability it's really that this area of the brain activates easier for her than for me. Um, when I look at words, it's, uh, I don't get my information necessarily through written language, but for her it uh, activates very simply when she searches and finds a letter or a word. It has more meaning for her than it does for me. Just like um, we talked about again about the high observer. For me, I look at that and I, and I place certain emphasis on on things that I see visually, and and to your point, I'm a bit more of a lower reader. I'm on, on the reader side myself. Now, um, I love reading. Um, I read differently. I read in smaller doses. Um, I tend to read things that, from a content standpoint, uh, jump out at me, and they hold my interest. So that process of actually decoding, because the subject matter tends to balance that out for me. Um, but reading, reading also relaxes me. 
um, active readers, they report back. It's almost like a, a little, you know, it's a dose of stimulus. It's a, it's like a little pop of an endorphin when they're reading. And so they're, you know, you, you may see people walking down the street and holding a book in front of their face. You could pretty much say, okay, they're probably a, a, an active reader because they're getting some positive neurostimulus out of that. Right. So, um, and that reminds me of uh, Aaron speaking about uh, she's a high reader uh, right. along with, uh, with active and high in, in all the other areas too. And that uh, she will um, at times with that dual processor be consuming large amounts of information and getting uh, stimulated, um, elevated. And that what she needs to do is to remember to, okay, maybe it's time to slow down a little bit, take a break right. and, and, and uh, you know, rest these uh, these neurostimulus areas of the brain to um, you know just and and um, you know because again it can it can elevate uh, oneself and, and then there's uh, again rest and, and um, relaxation meditation or and reflective states are very important Sure. Closing your eyes, you know, putting in earplugs or something like that. I mean, right. all, all of that. What, let's move on to the next slide here, because again, that goes back to the notion that we talked about, about cog hacks, and we'll be talking more about cog hacks in a different broadcast. Yeah. So, so uh, moving on to iTalker and then it's really the, the neurostimulus generated by the muscles we use to speak. Um, so all of this, um, from from the mouth down through the diaphragm and the air moving over the, the vocal cords. It is, um, as we speak, we start to think more clearly. Um, and so often uh, in the work that I've done in the past, we talk about um, verbal processors. A verbal processor who speaks very rapidly and uh, will will often uh, not stop talking. I would say that that is a actual a high talker and a high mover together. Yeah, that's um, your point, yes. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the thing to remember here is that uh, if you are a high talker, is to make space for others, right? To, uh, to be thinking about what you wanna say and that um, the, those around you understand that this is how you process information. Because often with high talkers, they'll state something and then um, everyone in the room heard a commitment, right? We just made a plan. <laughs> and uh, the high talker is sort of like, well, what did I just get myself into here? We, I didn't, I, you know, I, was just make, I was just making meaning. So that's, that's what, where uh, the high talker uh, lands. Well, one, one thing we've also found, though, too, is that um, d depending on if you are a high talker, if you're a little bit more low uh, or a bit lower on that scale, what's interesting about it is that people tend to talk in in a cadence or rhythm uh, within a, a kind of a, a, a very replicable, is that a word, a time frame, something that they can replicate. So if you look at it, you, you have a high talker, it may take them three minutes to get uh, an idea out. And so you can start timing yourself. Um, another, another cog hack might be for that could be take notes and stick to your talking points. Did I cover these points and then give yourself that time frame? So if you know that it will take you about three minutes to kind of, uh, go through an idea or, um, you know, working through a presentation, then, then anchor yourself with those types of talking points. And when you've hit them, that's when you know, that's when your wind down state could begin for people who might be a bit lower on the talker scale. Um, that's not the same as introversion that I'm, I'm going to get into a different area here, Cam. Some people say, well, I, I don't talk very much. Therefore I'm introverted. No, uh, you simply don't need to talk as much. Uh, but for someone who might be a bit lower in the talker uh, scale, know when to speak up, know when to jump in and know that it's actually a preferred state, uh, to not have to talk as much. And so we see some, you know, the, this, uh, cognitive disconnect between high and low talkers because the low talker is in a meeting and he's saying, you've already said that five times. And the high talker is saying, I need to reinforce this idea. I'm going to repeat it again and again. Well, are they reinforcing it for the group or are they reinforcing it for themselves? That's right. The other thing about a lower or selective talker yep. is um, to, or if you work with one, if you work with a, with a selective talker to encourage them to um, share in different ways right they might 
if they need to share in a, a memo, right, and to access their reader, uh, or it might be more kinesthetic or, or in movement of like, you know, what can you show me, right? Right. You show me how to do this versus, um, you know, uh, speaking out loud that, that we can share information. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, in the boardroom in a meeting. Uh, there's other ways to share information. That's right. Well, the final note on that that I had is I had, had a, a lower talker tell me one time that that you know the the issue that she had is that she she was a, a lower talker and a higher reader, um, and would would put a lot of information in front of her boss who was kind of the opposite uh, of those preferences. Uh, she put it in in text form or you know drop a brief or something like that, and um, and then you know when when she was trying to convey it verbally to him, he'd say, "Come on, you got to spit it out, spit it out, spit it out," which caused her to be more frustrated and then would actually say to her, you know, how come you gave me great information? How come you didn't say it sooner? And she said, Oh, I didn't know I could. But once, once she began to have these, uh, these insights, she started to really understand that it was, um, that, that a lot of it had to do with this preference. So, yeah. And I think that, uh, let's move to, yep. to, uh, the final one, the yeah. listener. And then, um, I'd like to follow up on that because I mean, this is where the versatility of the CPP comes in. Uh, so listener and along the lines of the others is again, it's uh, neurostimulus around uh, the presence of meaningful sound. Um, so a uh, listener measures our reflexive activation for this meaningful sound. Um, as, a, as an active listener, uh, when I turn my attention to it um, and am focused, this is where I get most of my, my information. Um, and so a, a, a more of a selective listener, it's uh, more of a noise, right? It's, it's not salient, it's not uh, where they, they necessarily create meaning. Um, listeners are really important to have on a team, right? that, that where you have individuals who are able to listen to what is being said in the, um, out in the open and then being able to reflect back um, can be very, very powerful. And, and the listening is, I've seen all these studies around leadership, uh, management, and how uh, listening is so important, right? The servant leader approach, and yet we don't do it, right? It's uh, people often, it's, they get in there and they try to tell people what to do. And this is something that we can, um, if you don't have that listener, uh, naturally, you can develop it. You can develop some some cog hacks around it, uh, really around you know, creating context around the conversation. What's the scope of this topic, and to be in the service of the other individual, right? To help help them uh, um, to um, be successful. Right of uh, you know being the service of others. Richard Biotsis talks about um, this compassionate listening is a wonderful skill, and it actually helps to reduce stress. Well, a, a couple of points about that. We had um, done some work with a number of uh, professional and NCAA level athletes, and a couple of baseball players. Uh, interestingly enough, they showed up on the CPP as being lower listeners, um, and as we talked our way through that. We we discovered really that, that the crowd noise didn't affect them at all. That they in fact it was just wallpaper. Um, didn't hear any you know cat calls or anyone yelling at them from the crowd at all. But they did hear what the coach had to say because that was that was the anchor point of their listening. If if the first base coach or whoever the that that point of contact was on the field was yelling at them, they heard that everything they needed to hear. Move here, do this, do that. But what they didn't hear is they just didn't hear the the. It's like a bandwidth. I I kind of you know. It, if you think about it as uh, Cam is like a Husky pencil versus a regular pencil. You know, somebody might be a little bit um, more active on the listener side versus more focused on the listener side. That's kind of what you can imagine as being, it's like bandwidth or conduit. Right. And, um, you know, you talk about Ted Williams, the reason he said, the reason why he was such a good hitter was because you could see the spin of the ball. Uh, right? So likely high observer. high observer. The other thing is out there, how do they send, how do they send messages? They send it through hand signals. That's right. Right. And so again, that high observer paying attention to that, they don't need that listener. And actually the, the high listener would be uh, in a sense detrimental here. 
That's right. a great point because because these guys were also high observers, uh, and and also no, another that we was a, a D one softball player too, and very much of a you know, a bit of a high observer, a little bit more of the lower listener side. Let's right. go ahead and try and sum up a little bit in the next couple of minutes if we can. Uh, yeah. So knowing your brain's profile is like having that secret weapon. Um, knowing how others' profile may impact you is like having a kryptonite detector. And engaging your cognitive assets lets you mentally maximize every situation. Uh, we are just starting to scratch the surface of the potential of the CPP. And as we, Perry and I have been having conversations with numerous people, um, and everyone takes it and uses it slightly differently. So what we're appreciating is the, the versatility. Right. But the first two bullet points are so important here. It's knowing about knowing about uh, myself, right? recognizing where my strengths are, where my blind spots are, so I can plan for it, so I can anticipate. And then it's, this is not about manipulation. I wanna be very careful. Uh, this, is, it's, it's, this is about transparency and honesty and that when you have a team that is uh, recognizes their cognitive preferences and knows the other person's, then it, it really has uh, the ability to that the team operate better. And like that story you said earlier in the sense of uh, the woman who uh, was, was trying to share information and getting cut down by the boss, right. recognizing, okay, the boss is like this or my manager is like this and I'm like this and how can we work better? And having that information is, uh, is really a great starting place because it cuts out all this assumption that our brain wants to make, right? Our brains will fill the void when it, doesn't, yeah. when it doesn't have enough information. And so this cognitive preference profile gives us some information so we can kind of cut out the messiness that occurs in any kind of dialogue or when humans get together. I agree, it's very potent. Believe me, we, it is very potent that we we're just scratching the surface, as you mentioned. So I want to thank everyone for joining today. Thank you, Cam. I, I, uh, I love the idea of being able to, to just walk through this a little bit and give uh, you know, folks some visual references. Um, more information is available at www.avalonleadership.com. Uh, you join, join Avalon, that's free. Um, if you'd like to take the, the CPP, after you join, you sign up, you can get your own account. Um, it's fifty nine ninety five, but there is a, a coupon code, and, and um, we're interested in, in getting more people involved in this. Uh, we'll be having some um, coaching engagements coming up, uh, what we call fireside chats, uh, through uh, February and March. Excuse me, March and April. Um, but it's very exciting work, um, and as I said, we are just now getting some traction on it. But thank you very much for everyone, everybody, for uh, joining today. And uh, we hope that we will see you again and stay tuned for more information. Uh, check us out on the web and uh, we look forward to checking in with you again. Take care.